Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's it's a real pleasure to to see you all. And of course, we normally be seeing each other in person at one of the, the national meetings. So hopefully, we'll get back to that when things um, allow. I have to say, huge thanks to the Pituitary Foundation staff, um, and I think probably Sean in particular for for all the work she's done in putting this together. So I was sent some questions last night by Sean. And what I've done is I've put them into some slides because quite a lot of them are quite lengthy and I've, I've, I've got some explanations on some of them. So if I can just um, share my screen. I'm now going to flip over to this and I hope this is now projecting. So is that projecting okay? Yeah, okay. So I've got a series of questions here, um, which I'm gonna go through. I will try and answer to the best of my ability. If you've asked the question and I haven't answered it fully, then you better let me know in the chat function and I'm sure Sean will pick me up and tell me to do it better next time. So I'll then be able to hopefully come back. But it, so if I haven't answered your question, please let me know and I'll try and get it done before the end of the session. Uh, there are around about uh, 14 questions here, I think, some of them longer than others. And if I can get through all these, then hopefully we can take any other remaining questions. Uh, and indeed, I can take some extra questions afterwards if you send them in to Shoshan. So let's just kick off. So question number one, I'm going to read it out and it's on the screen as well. We were given plenty of information on key hormones that need replacing with hypopituitarism, but are other hormones like serotonin, oxytonin, etc., affected? Is our happiness, anxiety, et cetera, also dependent on the pituitary? So the first thing to say is that all of the hormones that we replace from the front part of the pituitary, the anterior pituitary, have a major impact on your well-being, the way your body works, uh, and things like that. And then you've got the hormones from the posterior pituitary, uh, and those of you who have got diabetes and syphilis will know about this because you lack a hormone called vasopressin. And the vasopressin allows you to control your um, water con urine concentration. And without it, you, you end up passing a lot of urine and getting very thirsty. But the posterior pituitary also makes the hormone oxytocin. And that's very, very important, uh, really, during um, labor for women giving birth. But there's increasing evidence that it does have some impact on empathy and mood and other such things, but it's not very well studied. If I can just show a picture here to just put this into perspective, I'll try and, whoops, it's not allowing me to advance. There we go. So here is a, a, a picture, an MRI scan. So in fact, this is a, a slice through the middle of your head, the front of your head, your nose at the front here, the back of your head uh, over on the, the right hand side here, the top of your head at the top. And in the middle here is your pituitary. Can we just close that down? Um, and that's the anterior pituitary. So that's where the, the hormones that we replace, hydrocortisone, thyroxine, uh, are, are the hormones and, and testosterone in men, and estrogen in women that we replace, which are controlled from the anterior pituitary. And here is the posterior pituitary. If you look carefully, you'll see it's a bit brighter and often it's a bit brighter on these scans. And it's the posterior pituitary that control vasopressin uh, for which we replace with desmopressin and oxytocin, which at yet at the moment we don't replace. You've got this pituitary stalk, uh, you've got the optic chiasm, so the eye nerve at the top here, uh, and you've got the hypothalamus here. So this is uh, sort of the way this is all set up. Now, if I just take this little bit and explode it into a diagram, you end up with this. And what you have here is the anterior pituitary, so those are the hormones we often replace, and the posterior pituitary, and really the one we replace is vasopressin with desmopressin. But the difference between the front and the back is that the hormones from the anterior pituitary are made in the anterior pituitary and then released into the bloodstream. Whereas the posterior pituitary hormones are made up here in the hypothalamus. And they're made up in these nerve bodies and they travel down these nerve axons or stalks all the way down to the posterior pituitary and then are released. And you've got two main areas. You've got this area called the supraoptic nucleus and that mainly makes vasopressin. And you've got one called the paraventricular nuclei and they mainly make oxytocin. And so when you have problems with the pituitary, these are usually left intact and will usually be working. So it's very unusual for someone presenting with 
a tumor, for example, of the anterior pituitary to have problems with diabetes insipidus or indeed have problems uh, with oxytocin secretion. If you have tumors that start in the hypothalamus like chroniopharyngioma, that's different. Often these things are affected. So in most of the time, most patients uh, with pituitary problems, the posterior pituitary tends to work reasonably well. If it doesn't, you can end up with diabetes insipidus. But even if you have diabetes insipidus, you may well still have some oxytocin secretion. So I guess that's a, a longer winded way of answering the question is that oxytocin could be affected. It has as yet completely ill understood effects. It may be in the future that use of oxytocin, there's a sprays you can buy online, but they're not validated and I wouldn't recommend them. So I think that's an area that may occur and may develop. The other question about serotonin, well, serotonin in the circulation bears really no real resemblance to what serotonin, serotonin does to your mood. It's the serotonin within the brain, um, within the areas of the connections between the nerves where they connect and you've got signaling. So, so messages going from one nerve to the other, which is done with uh, things called neurotransmitters like serotonin. That's where the serotonin is important. Uh, and so really, I don't think uh, the serotonin in your circulation is, is really relevant. And certainly serotonin has got nothing specific to do with the pituitary. So I hope that answers that question. Question number two, all research seems to be focused on the physical effects, e.g. Uh, panhypopituitary, uh, as I do, but how does it affect less um, me mechanical issues such as concentration, happiness, and general emotional, uh, open quotes, wellness? Uh, and the question is not referring just to the emotional aspects that may attach to any long-standing medical issue. So, as I sort of iterated, I sort of illustrated my, the, the slide before, the, the hormones coming from the pituitary are so important for the way your body works. And the, in normal circumstances, the regulation is, is just beautifully done. You've got uh, action from a pituitary hormone being released. That then flows through the body, acts on a distant gland. That produces a hormone. That hormone then feeds back to limit and uh, control its own secretion in what we call negative feedback loops. And the problem, of course, is when we have a problem with the pituitary, is that is all disrupted. Uh, and you get endocrinologists who attempt, and I use the word advisedly, attempt to try and give patients the correct treatment to replace what the pituitary is doing. But of course, it's nowhere near, absolutely nowhere near as good as what the normal pituitary would do if it wasn't uh, affected. And so if you have someone who's panhypopituitary on replacement treatment, we aim to get that as good as possible. And in some patients, they have absolutely fine and they really don't have any problems at all. And in some other patients, they really continue to have significant problems associated with our inability to be able to replace those hormones uh, as well as they should have. And so, yes, it can affect concentration. And yes, it can affect people's mood and other such things. Uh, and so we aim to try and get the replacement uh, as, as, as good as we can, but we're limited uh, by virtue of the fact that we just simply don't have the right tools to be able to do that. So if I take, for example, cortisol or hydrocortisone. So cortisol and hydrocortisone, that's the same thing. Hydrocortisone is just the chemical name for cortisol. Normally, when you have a normal functioning pituitary, when you wake up, you have a high level of cortisol that gradually falls over the day and the levels reach quite low levels during the nighttime. If you've got a pituitary problem, you wake up with essentially no cortisol. You take your hydrocortisone, it gets into your bloodstream 20 or 30 minutes later, goes up high and then starts falling down by about lunchtime. Many people then take another tablet, goes up high and then starts falling down by tea time, take another tablet and it goes down. So you get a sort of sawtooth pattern which in some people they feel okay and some people less so. And it can impact greatly on their ability to concentrate, their amount of energy, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's an illustration of some of the challenges we have um, about trying to improve patients' replacement therapy. And there are some developments coming online and let's hope within the next five to 10 years, we can offer better replacement therapy. And the hope would be that may improve some of these issues uh, that have been raised by this question. 
Question number three. Uh, so this is a, a quite a specific question, but I'll go through it. Once all avenues have been exhausted to treat a stable-sized macroprolactinoma, what would you suggest to manage the effects of high prolactin and suppressed hormones? So a macroprolactinoma just means a big prolactinoma, prolactin-secreting tumor. The context. My levels float around about 90,000. And, and for those of you on the call who are not familiar, uh, the upper limit of normal in men is around about three to 400, in women uh, around about five to 600. So that's very elevated. And I've reached over 133,000 off medication. All medications have been tried over 12 years. The tumor size is stable in the cavernous sinus, hence the reluctance to operate. And it's also not affecting my sight or causing major headaches. So the issues here is, is really, uh, so the first thing to say is, you know, this clearly is a question from someone who will have been seen um, at length by their own endocrinologist. And uh, the other sort of disclaimer I should have started with is all the answers to my questions are really main, mainly general questions. And of course, if you do have questions, your first border call should be with your endocrinologist. Here, if you've got a high prolactin level, and you've got a tumor that's stable, and it's not pressing on your eye nerves, and you've not got any other symptoms, then actually you don't have to have anything done about it. Um, and that might sound strange, because you might wonder, well, what about the high prolactin level? Well, the high prolactin level does suppress the activity of the remaining pituitary, or it could just be that you've got a big mass, a big uh, tumor that suppresses the action of the pituitary. But nevertheless, in, in this circumstance, the answer to this question, if the tumor is stable, then one would replace the other pituitary hormones that need to be replaced. And one can just watch and monitor with MRI scans um, on the uh, size of the tumor, because there's no benefit to doing uh, a risky operation when the patient or the questioner here is actually not suffering any of the effects. Of course, if someone had a lot of galactorrhea, so milk from the breast and is high prolactin, that would be a bit different. You'd be doing everything you could to suppress it. But if that isn't the case, and someone's otherwise, uh, well, there's nothing else that, that we would really recommend doing. Although this clearly is a tumor that's resistant to the effects of the treatments, which are usually um, dopamine agonists. So one can at times consider things like radiotherapy if they're not being, if the tumor's not being controlled uh, and if uh, there's still a problem. But again, that's a discussion to be had with the uh, treating endocrinologist. And it sounds to me as if the person asking this question is otherwise well, it sounds you just probably just as you are in, in most circumstances. Question number four, I was diagnosed with Sheehan syndrome six years ago after uh, following significant blood loss during child labor 13 years ago. Is this a degenerative condition and what, if any, are the effects on the body as a result of having to take so much medication, in particular steroids for life and daily injections of growth hormone? So the first thing to say is that, um, fortunately, nowadays, Sheehan syndrome is quite uncommon. And so what happens is that when a woman is pregnant, the pituitary gland increases in size to probably about two, twice the normal size that it is uh, when people aren't pregnant. And what can happen when you have a, uh, a catastrophic uh, loss of blood at the time that someone delivers is the blood pressure drops very quickly and the blood supply of the pituitary is insufficient and then the pituitary uh, effectively can, can, can die and, and therefore not actually work in the future. So with modern obstetric practice, Sheehan syndrome is, is not so common. It isn't degenerative, it's a one-off thing but it doesn't improve. So if your pituitary has what we call infarcted or died, then it's not gonna come back. And yes, you would, would need to be on replacement therapy for the rest of your life. Now, in answer to your question about so much medication, particularly steroids, et cetera. So I would um, suggest thinking about the hydrocortisone that you take, not as a medication. I think about it as something giving you back what your body's missing and what, endocrinologist should be doing is working with you to try and make sure that you're on the right dose, neither too much or too little. And if you're on the right dose, then really you're not having extra steroids. You're just having the right amount of steroids that your body would need. If you don't have steroids, you become very, very unwell. If you have too many steroids, then yes, you become uh, unwell too. 
And if you lack growth hormone and need growth hormone, again, they are designed to try and give you back what your body's missing. But again, it's this caveat that, that these replacement doses we, we advise and give can never truly replace what your pituitary would have done had it not been affected by Sheehan syndrome. So I hope that answers uh, that question. Question number five, what's the latest guidance on weight control with regard to acromegaly? And is the term hypothalamic obesity a recognized condition or just a generalization? I am diagnosed as being chronic acromegalic after having a transmodal hypophysectomy 20 years ago and generally getting by with a yearly review of the endocrinology department. However, keeping my weight under control is something I have great difficulty with. So first thing to say is that when someone has active acromegaly, actually the growth hormones, quite a good way of keeping fat under control because it helps the body uh, remove fat. Um, so it is possible that when acromegaly is control that someone may experience some weight gain and weight gain with fat rather than lean muscle. The second thing to say is that hypothalamic obesity certainly is a recognized condition and not just a generalized condition. Um, but I want to show you some, uh, some slides just to sort of put that into context. So here's that picture of the pituitary gland again, sitting down here with the hypothalamus. So hypothalamic obesity is when this area here is affected. And that's particularly the case when you have um, some tumors which often appear in childhood, sometimes in adulthood, but often in childhood, called craniopharyngioma. They often impact on this area here, and they can cause problems with the appetite centers. So the appetite centers that control our appetite are centered up in this area here. So you have some patients who have these really disrupted, such that really they have no regulation of appetite. They never feel full, so they keep on eating. And that's what is termed true hypothalamic obesity. Now, most of the time with pituitary tumors, that doesn't occur. So I'm gonna show you a slide here. So this is a huge pituitary tumor. And you can see it's pressing on the optic nerve here, this massive pituitary tumor. So this is taken slicing through your head, looking straight on. So in fact, that's the right-hand side, that's the left-hand side. But even with this massive tumor like this, hypothalamic obesity would be very uncommon because once this has been taken away, even though it's pressing up into the hypothalamus, it usually allows the hypothalamus to be okay. But of course it is possible that there could be hypothalamic damage either through surgery or subsequent treatments and radiotherapy, et cetera. More likely if someone with an anterior pituitary tumor is, uh, is having problems with uh, weight loss, it probably does not relate to hypothalamic obesity because that's when you truly don't have regulation of your appetite. And then I think the question is, is are you on the correct replacement therapies? Could it be that you're on more hydrocortisone than you need? Could it be that you're lacking growth hormone? So some patients with acromegaly paradoxically end up giving back growth hormone because they lack growth hormone in the long run. Uh, or could it be they're on the correct dose of thyroxine? Or could it be there's just there's some other cause? So we've got all of the things balanced with the pituitary as well as can be, be done. Um, but then you've still got problems with uh, obesity. So it isn't just that someone has a pituitary tumor that causes a hypothalamic problem. That's actually quite uncommon. It's much more common that there may be some imbalances in getting the replacement therapy right, or indeed that actually the pituitary is not related to the difficulty someone's experiencing uh, with their weight. Question number six. Um, is Prof. John or anybody familiar with IgG4 hypophysitis? I've been diagnosed with this following transmodal op operation in December 2020. It's impacting the pituitary in a similar way to lymphocytic hypophysitis in that I have high prolactin, amenorrhea, that's less lack of periods, and diabetes insipidus. Uh, it presents with unbearable headaches, extreme thirst, peeing, and a stop in the periods. I'm looking for some advice on how to manage this. Okay, so... Um, hypophysitis just means inflammation in the pituitary gland. And that can be this term here, which has been alluded to, lymphocytic hypophysitis, or it can be this less common thing here called IgG4 hypophysitis. But the thing that's different about these inflammation of the pituitary, and this is where you get 
immune cells attacking the pituitary is that it tends to attack both the front of the pituitary gland and the back of the pituitary gland. And as a consequence, it's common that if people have these conditions, that they'll present with lack of the anterior pituitary hormones, but also lose the vasopressin in the back of the pituitary. So then present with diabetes insipidus. And if you, um, uh, you can indeed get high prolactin if there's swelling of the pituitary gland. And of course, if you don't have the hormones driving the ovaries uh, to, to cause a normal menstrual cycle, you end up with uh, not having periods. So any form of inflammation in the pituitary can cause this. And if you've had an operation that shows that this is IgG4, that's a particular type of um, inflammation in the pituitary. And in IgG4, uh, in some patients, they can get uh, other problems in other parts of the body. So at times we will look for that with other scans, et cetera. If it's just isolated the pituitary, then the treatment of it uh, is often involving uh, use of things to damp down the inflammation. So we may have to use high doses of drugs like prednisolone, a steroid. And in the longer term, we may have to use other drugs which work in the same way that prednisolone would work, but without the side effects of being on long-term high dose steroids. So drugs like azathioprine, mycophthalate, and, and other such things. So it is different from the pituitary tumor, it's inflammation. With the IgG4, it can be in the pituitary and other parts of the body. With lymphocytic hypophysitis, it's actually usually just uh, located to the pituitary itself. And actually, lymphocytic hypophysitis is most commonly associated uh, in women, particularly in the period just after birth. Uh, and we, we had a case, or we had a question rather, about Sheehan syndrome. But nowadays, more commonly, if someone presents with the sort of picture one used to get with Sheehan syndrome, it's more likely actually they've got lymphocytic hypophysitis uh, rather than infarction of the pituitary because of uh, the blood loss. Question number seven. Uh, sorry, so going back, how do I manage this? Well, it's managed by replacing the pituitary hormones and it's managed by suppressing the inflammation if it needs to be suppressed. And that's usually with steroids and these other drugs I've just mentioned. Question number seven. Uh, so this is a big one. Um, I suspect we could spend the rest of the afternoon on this particular one. Um, how can we increase awareness amongst GPs of our rare condition? Not so much for those of us who've been diagnosed, but those in the early stages suffering misery, mystery syndrome symptoms and relying on luck as much as anything to get a diagnosis. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, it's a challenge. Uh, I don't have a full answer. I think the Pituitary Foundation do a huge amount of work in this. There are uh, campaigns, GP fact files, uh, from our side, um, we, of course, educate our medical students. Uh, we interact with GPs. Uh, we give talks, um, et cetera, and we have campaigns. But you're right. How do we do it? it, it it's, it's, a, it's a difficult and challenging problem that I don't have the answer to other than keeping on trying to um, educate the GPs about this. One of the particular areas we as endocrinologists uh, and you as patients have great problems with is thyroxine replacement therapy, where a GP may inadvertently reduce the dose of thyroxine because they're looking at the uh, level of TSH, uh, which is the way we monitor patients when they're lacking a thyroid, they've got primary hypothyroidism, but in pituitary disease, you can't do that. They need to measure the free T4. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to get it across. And uh, several times a week, uh, I'll be writing letters to GP asking them not to reduce uh, the dose of thyroxine. And that's an ongoing issue, uh, even for the people when they're diagnosed. So yes, the vague symptoms or the mystery symptoms that people can have, I think the problem is, is that many of these things initially at least can be rather vague until something more specific happens. And that can be challenging for a GP to recognize amongst the huge numbers of different other conditions that might present to a GP. Does uh, anything other than Cushing's cause a distinct buffalo hump? Even when I stand up straight, it's still there. And my head feels too heavy to hold it upright due to the hump. I've caused so much pain. I'm not diagnosed yet, but just began to see Dr. Friedman uh, R of LA. So I think that's of Los Angeles. So I think this is an international question. 
Um, so it's nice to have an international question. Um, so a, a buffalo hump is, I think, a rather unpleasant description. It really refers to uh, increased uh, amount of fat behind the neck, causing a swelling behind the neck. Yes, you can get that in Cushing's, but yes, you can get it in just obesity. Uh, you can also get it when um, some people are on extra drugs. So if people are on extra steroids, then they can actually get a, a, a Cushing's from being on steroid tablets, high dose that is, not the replacement dose you take in, in pituitary disease. Um, some patients who take various HIV drugs can, can get this. And the other thing to say is sometimes it happens when people get older because you get a change in the upper spine that means you've got a, a greater curvature of the spine going forward, which can then accentuate uh, any uh, uh, hump that one gets uh, higher up in the back. So yes, there are other causes. Uh, it's not at all specific to Cushing's. It's not a very discriminating sign for Cushing's at all, although patients with Cushing's do get it. The vast majority of patients uh, who have extra fat in that position will not have, or the vast majority of the population uh, with extra fat in the area will not have Cushing's. So on the same lines, could a 1% hydrocortisone cream used twice daily for six months called Cushing's or is 1% too low? I'm not sure if this is triggered by the answer. I did a, a Cushing's Q&A early in the week and one of the questions was about um, exogenous glucocorticoids. So it's all about dose. So if you covered your entire body in 1% hydrocortisone cream, then yes, I suspect you could give enough uh, to certainly cause Cushing's. If it's just a small area on your skin twice a day, absolutely not. 1% would be too low. And usually with the creams, particularly more potent creams that uh, such as Dermavate and other things like that, unless you're using an awful lot of the creams, and unless they are getting absorbed systemically, so particularly if people have got broken skin, so for example, some patients with conditions such as eczema or psoriasis can absorb quite a lot more, then it's less likely that you get sufficient to cause cushions. But is it possible? Yes, but it depends on how much has been given, the amount of, of skin that's been covered and the state of, of, of the skin. Um, and so uh, I could never say no, but usually a 1% hydrocortisone cream is, is far less likely to cause this than some of the more potent other topical steroids. Question number 10. So this is a, a really important question because thyroxine is taken so commonly. As CA, that's calcium, interferes with absorption of thyroxine, how long should I wait before taking calcium tablets? So if you look in the British National Formula, it'll say four hours. To, to avoid taking, so if you take your thyroxine, wait for four hours, you take your calcium, wait for the thyroxine for four hours. That, that's probably being over careful, but the manufacturers uh, want to try and avoid any particular problems. Having said that, um, if one sort of imagines that someone is on a stable dose of thyroxine and on a stable dose of calcium tablets, for example, uh, ADCAL D3 or something that someone's taking for osteoporosis, if you're on a stable dose and you're taking it however you're taking it and your thyroid levels are fine, then that's fine. It doesn't matter. You might be taking an extra 25 micrograms more than you need, but to be honest, that doesn't matter. Uh, I think better you just stay as you are than try and change it. If you're about to be started on calcium tablets, then I think it is sensible to try and space things out. Take your thyroxine first thing in the morning before you, you have anything else to eat. Wait a good hour or so before you take your calcium tablets. Um, I think four hours is probably overkill. Um, or, of course, you can flip it. So you take your thyroxine last thing at night. Uh, so the thyroxine you take today starts working in sort of three to five days' time. So you won't suddenly feel weird overnight if you take your thyroxine at night. And that's often a good way to take thyroxine in some people if they've got other drugs they need to take, which might interfere with absorption. Again, please ask your endocrinologist before you start changing the time of day when you take your medication. Question number 11. Um, are there some people like my daughter who's 23 years of age who just don't fit any picture, leaving us feeling we don't belong to any group? She makes no cortisol, but her ACTH levels are completely normal, although ACTH was unable to be tested prior to starting intravenous hydrocortisone 
no prior steroid use, waiting on genetic results for possible Algro syndrome. Um, so I, I think um, I'll, I'll just show a picture, which I, I hope will explain this. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer this question. What I will say from the outset is it would be extraordinarily unusual for someone to present age 23 with a genetically driven condition such as Allgrove syndrome. Um, so here is the normal way the pituitary works. You've got the pituitary here, makes the hormone ACTH, drives the adrenal glands to make cortisol. If you lack adrenal glands, so if you've got Addison's disease, the adrenal glands are small, then you have no cortisol. And as a consequence, there's lack of feedback to the pituitary. So the ACTH levels are actually high. And in those circumstances, um, what, what, what happens is that um, in those circumstances, what happens, you need to take the hormones that are made in the various layers of the uh, adrenal. So really it's the hydrocortisone and in patients with Addison's, they have to take fludrocortisone as well. Now there is a further condition where you actually don't respond to the ACTH that's being produced. And Allgrove syndrome is one of those. It's due to a mutation in a gene called Aladdin. There's another um, thing called familial glucocorticoid deficiency due to mutation in a gene called MRAP. And what these do is you've got the adrenal glands, but they simply don't respond to ACTH and therefore the cortisol levels low. And in these patients, they would have to take just hydrocortisone because the layers that produce the aldosterone hormone, the one that you take, the, for, take fludrocortisone for in Addison's disease, is still present. Um, so that would be Allgro syndrome or phenomenal glucocorticoid deficiency. Unusual for someone to present with these type of things beyond the first decade of life. Very unusual for present even in the second decade of life. I think by the time you get to 23, that's a unlikely to be a diagnosis, but perhaps it could be. Um, you state in your question, the ACTH is normal, but of course, if you've got pituitary disease, your ACTH can well be uh, normal uh, and you lack uh, cortisol. So I think in answer to the question, just going back, I think it is more likely here that there, there's some problem with uh, um, the ACTH, the, the pituitary, if anything, if there's been no steroids in the past. Um, but um, I'm not going to be able to answer more than that, except just going through how the normal pituitary is, is regulated. Question 12, I take hydrocortisone, 20 milligrams, uh, 10 milligrams in the morning, five milligrams lunch, and five milligrams tea time, and thyroxine 100 uh, milligrams in the morning. I'm problem losing weight, and my GP has prescribed all a stat. 120 milligrams taken three times a day. Is this okay? Um, Yes, it probably can be okay. I, I, the, 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 real, the, the only real danger is could the orlistat prevent the absorption of the hydrocortisone? And, it, and the answer is it probably won't um, And because orlistat itself is not absorbed. So what orlistat does is that it presents, prevents the um, absorptions of the fat uh, in your diet, but uh, hydrocortisone can actually... Um, uh, to be, be sort of uh, fixed into the fat. And so therefore you've got to be a bit careful. So I think my advice here would be, yes, you can take it, but just make sure that the orlistat is being taken at times and it's well away from the doses of the hydrocortisone being taken. Uh, so the hydrocortisone is a good chance of being absorbed. So hydrocortisone is almost completely absorbed uh, within the first 20 to 30 minutes of it being taken. So I suspect you'll be able to time it so you're taking your list at uh, a good sort of hour after you're taking your uh, hydrocortisone. Um, I accept that that may not be so easy necessarily, but, but I, I, um, that, that's what I'd suggest. And again, with the thyroxine, you could take it first thing in the morning with the first dose of hydrocortisone. Hopefully, if you take it prior to uh, the orlistat being taken, that would work as well. Um, so this is a long question. Um, and it, this is the, the first of two similar questions. Uh, and then that's uh, the questions are finished uh, and we can open it up to whatever Sean's got on the chat. 
Um, so I've previously had an immunological reaction to my flu vaccine and allergic, but not anaphylactic reactions. My endocrinologist advised further vaccinations for flu pneumonia were worth the risk, but then my GP refused to give any vaccinations and cautioned me accordingly. Been encouraged to have the COVID-19 vaccination after weighing up the risks. And thankfully the Pituitary Foundation nurse Pauline offered very practical advice to have this done in a hospital setting. I had the Pfizer vaccination and immediately felt nauseous and have had varying expected symptoms of sore arm, fevers, chills, horrendous headaches, fatigue, and generally feeling unwell. The nausea and the headaches have continued for almost two weeks. And as a precaution, I've doubled my steroids at first. My worry is, will the second dose give me even greater side effects? Sadly, due to a fall, I'm spending lockdown with my partner and out of my GP area, and they will not offer any advice. Can you advise, please? So that's question one. And question two on this, or question 14. Although I have had a pituitary condition for a long time, sometimes I feel I require extra cortisone more regularly. For example, as a reaction to the COVID vaccine, it left me absolutely shattered, requiring an extra dose of hydrocortisone and the overwhelming need to sleep. Is this normal? So both these questions are really COVID vaccine. So the, the headline is, yes, everybody, everybody should be getting the vaccine. None of the vaccine contain, none of the COVID vaccines contain anything like the egg products, which some of the flu vaccines can, which cause allergy in some people. But it's, it's completely the case that some people feel significantly unwell after the vaccine, the first dose. If you are systemically unwell and you are taking hydrocortisone, and if you particularly if you get a fever, then you should follow the sick day rules. Yes, increase your hydrocortisone if that occurs, but not routinely. And but, but have a low threshold for taking the hydrocortisone. Doubling a dose of hydrocortisone is, is never going to cause you harm. And if you've got concerns, then you should be in contact with your endocrine nurse specialist. The difficulty is that some people certainly feel a lot worse on the second dose of vaccine. Not everyone. Uh, I've had colleagues who have felt pretty lousy, um, and particularly those of us who have been in, in, in contact with quite a lot of COVID probably have already got some uh, immunity. So when you then get a vaccine, you're then going to end up um, actually just feeling worse because your immune system is already uh, revved up to um, respond to the vaccine. So yes, the second dose, you may feel worse. Um, I've put there two guidelines. So the Pituitary Foundation, the upper uh, panel here, that's got a thing on the COVID vaccine. And on the Pituitary Foundation, there's a link to this, which is the Society of Endocrinology um, advice on the COVID vaccine. But essentially, the advice is summarized here. If you feel unwell, take extra sick day rules of hydrocortisone, but you should definitely, definitely have the vaccine. Um, and so with that, I have come to the end of the Q&A questions that were pre-submitted. So I'm now gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for that, John. Going over all of the questions that have come in in advance. I know there's quite a big range there, so you've done, you've done well to cover everything and all the COVID information in particular has been a really popular topic of conversation this week. So it's really good to have that included. Um, we've got one here that's just come in, quite, quite a big question. Um, what are the new treatments and technologies in the pipeline we can look forward to in the next five to 10 years? Um, well, technologies I'm not sure about. Uh, I think modifications to therapies uh, are certainly coming apace. So uh, if I skip through them, um, glucocorticoid or, or, or steroid replacement. So there are new tablet formulations coming online. They've not yet been tested in patients with pituitary disease. They are and have been tested in patients with adrenal disease. Um, I've been involved in some of these trials uh, or, and, and they, they seem to make a big difference to a lot of patients. They're not yet licensed. Uh, it's not clear when they'll be licensed. Even if they're licensed, it's not clear whether they'll get a market authorization within the UK, et cetera, et cetera. But they certainly look to be things which will make a, a, a big difference uh, in some patients. Um, although, of course, some other patients who are on hydrocortisone feel fine, less so. There are newer formulations uh, coming online of 
um, somatostatin analogs. So these are things that are used for the treatment of patients with acromegaly. There are oral rather than injectable forms coming online. Uh, and there are several different companies making oral agents, and there are other companies making injections that could last up to three months. So those would be two different ways uh, of, of changes that could be done. And I think they're likely, again, to be available within the next um, five years or so, probably. There are new versions or new types of growth hormone coming on, sort of once weekly dosing rather than daily dosing. Uh, and so that will have the advantage of convenience. We don't yet know whether that's going to advantage to patients because growth hormones are highly pulsatile hormones. So in normal circumstances, you have your levels going up and down over the day a lot. So even with once daily dosing, that's not at all physiological. Um, uh, but when patients respond well to growth hormone, they're responding well to these once daily doses, I would anticipate that it's likely that people who respond well to the once daily would respond well to the once weekly, and that would be more convenient. So that's a, another thing which is, um, is, is changing. So those are sort of some of the types of medication. Technologies, so you, you may have heard of things like pump therapy for hydrocortisone. Uh, they're complicated. Um, ostensibly, it makes sense that if you had a pump delivering the normal sort of rhythm of, of, of cortisol, that would actually uh, be of benefit. Uh, there have been some placebo-controlled double-blind trials in patients with uh, adrenal insufficiency from Addison's disease. And in these small trials, the pump therapy didn't appear to hold a major benefit. Uh, but of course, the trials were small, uh, may have been underpowered to find an effect. Um, and there are certain groups which are still uh, advancing the, the notion of giving hydrocortisone therapy by pump therapy. And I think that's an open question. It may yet be um, something which, which may be of benefit, but of course it's far more complex than taking tablets. And it may be that with some of the advances in the, in, in the tablets uh, that are being developed at the moment, that, that they will actually be sufficient. But I think that's another area where, where there may be some advances. Brilliant, thank you. Um, another quite another quite general one here. What effect does the lack of signals from the pituitary have on the thyroid and other glands? Do they just okay. idle? Yeah, well, they, they exactly so. So the pituitary is often described as the conductor of the orchestra, and so it's the master gland. So it controls the the anterior pituitary makes six main hormones. It makes a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone. And that stimulates the thyroid to make thyroxine. Uh, if you lack thyroid stimulating hormone because your pituitary isn't producing it, then you won't produce the thyroxine. The treatment of that is to take thyroxine um, uh, in the same way that if you lack a thyroid gland, you would take thyroxine. And the same goes for um, if your pituitary doesn't make the two hormones that, that drive the ovaries, so that's luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone that are released in this amazingly um, defined rhythm that then causes menstrual cycles. If you don't have those hormones properly, then uh, periods stop in women and men, uh, their testosterone levels fall. And the way you would treat that in men is to replace the testosterone. And for the men on testosterone, they'll be familiar that you've got gels and injections, etc. Um, which some people find okay and some people don't. Uh, one of the other developments that, that, that's going on at the moment, and I'm also involved, is developing a new tablet of testosterone. We're at very early stages of that at the moment. And then in women, um, if they lack uh, the things that are driving the ovaries, then you may need estrogen replacement therapy. Uh, and depending on your age, you may need to also have it in the form where you, you have menstrual bleeds. So, of course, the oral contraceptive pill is one way of achieving that. And, um, but if, if a woman or a man wants to get pregnant, so if your pituitary isn't working, not only if you're a man will you lack testosterone, if, it's, if those hormones aren't there, you will also not produce the sperm. But the good news is that we can usually make or help men get sperm by giving them the similar injections to the pituitary to drive the, the testes to make the sperm. And actually it creates the testosterone at the same time. And similarly in women, you can have the similar hormones being uh, administered to drive the ovaries uh, to make them release eggs. But 
in all these circumstances, it's sort of in an assisted perception unit and, and carefully coordinated and making sure that everyone's uh, checked out so that pregnancy is going to be possible for them. So yes, the pituitary controls the thyroid, the adrenals, the testes, the ovaries, and if the pituitary isn't working, those other glands just don't work properly. Thank you. Um, and I know we have already touched on the COVID vaccine, but just another question in relation to mm -hmm. it, um, if you can help. With, will the COVID vaccine work for anyone with a failed pituitary gland? My father was told while receiving his first dose of the vaccine that it may not work. Well, I, mm, so I, I think the short answer is uh, almost certainly it will work. Do we truly know? No, we don't truly know. Uh, there's no reason to think that anyone with pituitary disease shouldn't respond normally in a normal immune response. I think the, the people that we're more concerned about who may not mount a normal uh, immune response are people who are on significant doses of drugs that damp down the immune system. And patients with pituitary disease, by and large, are not on those drugs. They're on replacement doses of uh, steroids. So it may be that uh, the question is farther, because they happen to be on steroids, were were ill-advised to say, well, you may not respond because the person giving it thought, well, you're on steroids. But of course, you're on a dose of steroids that the body would normally make, hopefully. And, and the sorts of doses that, that would be sufficient to damp down the immune response are sort of 100 milligrams of hydrocortisone a day or 200 milligrams of hydrocortisone a day, not, not 15 milligrams of hydrocortisone a day. Okay, thank you. And then we've got another a Cushing's related one here. So a bit of context. I have started to have Cushing symptoms again after 10 years after having surgery to remove a macro adenoma. I have been using 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone since surgery, managing well on this dose. I have reduced my hydrocortisone to 15 milligrams daily for the last week to see if this makes a difference. My question is, is it possible for the pituitary and adrenal glands to recover after 10 years of steroid dependency? So sorry, if I can just a clarification on the question. So the, 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 the questioner is, is currently on hydrocortisone where they think the Cushing's may be coming back. Yeah, so it's, they're asking, um, is it possible for the glands to recover after 10 years of steroid dependency? And they've been on 20 milligrams since surgery for 10 years, but in the last week um, have reduced to 15 milligrams. Okay. To see if um, it makes a difference. Okay, so um, for reasons that we don't understand, when, so when someone has a small tumor in the pituitary that causes Cushing's, if that small tumor is taken out, the usual, and it's taken out successfully, what usually happens is because the high cortisol levels that have been there before the operation have switched off the remaining pituitary and it, and it stays asleep often for a year or two, sometimes a shorter period of time, but often up to a year, sometimes a bit longer. And we don't know truly why that is, uh, but that's a very common occurrence. What typically happens then is that the pituitary starts recovering and then it drives the adrenal to recover. The levels gradually increase and we whittle down the dose of hydrocortisone. And then you get to a stage where the pituitary is working normally, the adrenal is working normally, and the patient doesn't have Cushing's anymore. There's still a risk that the Cushing's could come back. We recognize on long-term follow-up, unfortunately, up to 30% of patients can get a recurrence of their Cushing's 30, 40 years over that period of time. We don't understand why that is, but it is just the case that it can happen. If someone with Cushing's has required hydrocortisone, required it for quite a number of years afterwards, i.e. their own um, pituitary hasn't woken up and started to work, it becomes less and less likely that that will ever happen. So I have some patients whose pituitary is sort of waking up three or four years later. By 10 years, I think if it hasn't happened, it probably isn't going to happen. Don't, but in medicine, we never say never. So it's conceivable that someone may be able to come off their the hydrocortisone after 10 years, but I just think it's less likely. Of course, if that individual who's been on their hydrocortisone for 10 years then for whatever reason, there is a few little cells which have been there all the time from the tumor, they gradually grow and give them their Cushing's back. Well, of course, then they'll find that they won't need as much hydrocortisone. So it would be, 
Um, I think unusual at 10 years. Uh, my advice to whoever's asked that question is if you feel something's amiss, you need to discuss it with your endocrinologist because actually working out what's going on in that situation is not very difficult. It, it just requires some blood tests taken at the right time of day. Um, and you can just it simply need your cortisol level to be measured before your dose of hydrocortisone in the morning. If that level is still very low, but you haven't got Cushing's back and you still need to take your hydrocortisone. Thank you. Okay, we've got one now about uh, empty cellar. So should someone with empty cellar expect to see extra hormones supplemented as they age, i.e. I'm already on say thyroxine, should we expect to see to need testosterone, HGH and ultimately hydrocortisone as the years go by? So the first thing to say is that for the vast majority of people who have got quote unquote empty cellar, there is no problem with the pituitary. Um, an empty cell is an appearance uh, on imaging. And so, and usually it's when you look at the pituitary and you see that the pituitary fossa, so the pituitary sits in a sort of bony cavity, and you can see that, but actually there's very little pituitary tissue that you can see, and that's called empty cell. Almost all people with that have completely normal pituitary function. The, so there are some people who have been labeled quote unquote empty cellar uh, and they may not have pituitary function but that would need to have been established by the appropriate testing etc if one has empty cellar and they've got dysfunction of their pituitary that's likely to be static and not advanced and not get worse so if you're missing one hormone it's unlikely you're going to start missing another one but it's just unusual so if you've what can happen is some people uh, the I, one of the concepts is you could have had a pituitary tumor that may then have uh, infarcted, lost its blood supply, and then just shrunk down and been left without the production of the uh, pituitary hormones, in which case you would be on whatever pituitary hormones that are not working then, unlikely it's going to get worse. Okay, thank you. Um, we've probably got time for a couple more, but what I'm going to suggest is some of these are a bit longer with a few more details so I'm going to collect them and see if we can maybe address them I'm, I'm happy afterwards. to stay online if, if other people are so that's all right <laughs> okay we'll do a couple more now um but any that we've missed we've made note of all of them so they're not going to be forgotten um okay I'll go with this one next if the adrenals are halted by radiotherapy is there any chance they could start producing cortisol again uh, so, so I'm assuming the, the question means from radiotherapy to the pituitary, because uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't give radiotherapy to the adrenals. So this is, if someone with pituitary disease has had radiotherapy, and as a consequence, the amount of ACTH, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, coming from the pituitary has then fallen down, that doesn't recover. Uh, and so if in that circumstance, one then needs to take hydrocortisone, you're going to need to take hydrocortisone for good. It, it, it won't recover. It doesn't reverse. Okay, thank you. Um, bit of a longer one here, but I'll, I'll try and read it out clearly. Um, our daughter has panhypopituitarism following germinoma at five years. She is 42 years old now with a learning disability. Will she go through the menopause? Her period stopped during teenage years, but recently she's been fitted with the coil after bleeding heavily, now occasional spotting. She refused to take the growth hormone injection 18 months ago and her well-being has gone downhill. So if, 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 if she's spontaneously having periods by virtue of the fact that she was bleeding, then that means that uh, the hormones which are controlling her periods um, are still working. So the menopause is, is nothing to do with the pituitary. The menopause is due to the ovaries stopping. Um, and uh, in this circumstance, yes, she will go through a normal menopause. Her ovaries will, will, will stop working at whatever pre-destined sort of destined time it was due to happen in her. Um, and as you know, that we sometime around the fifth or sixth decade in most, in most people. Um, and if, if she had the germinoma when she's five and she hasn't developed um, failure of the hormones that are driving her um, 
over it at this stage, then it's unlikely that she will do it. I, I guess it's a bit surprising and pretty amazing that that, that hasn't happened. In terms of the growth hormone side of things, um, well, if, if her if her quality of life has diminished and she's she's she stopped it, then I, I suppose it's down to a question of whether she can be persuaded to take it again um, or not. Uh, it, it it may well be that she doesn't feel as well when she's not on growth hormone. Thank you. Um, we've got an, one from an acromegaly patient here. So. Currently on 10 milligrams of pegvisamont daily, 120 milligrams lamreotide every four weeks, and cabergoline 500 micrograms per week. Radiotherapy eight years ago, IGF-1 now within reference range. Would you start to reduce medications? And if so, how would you approach this? Uh, what I would do is, yeah, okay. So this is a, a complicated question. Um, it will depend. Um, so the hope would be that after the radiotherapy, you may well need fewer of these medications. The question I would need to know is what does your tumor look like in terms of its size and shape? How many surgeries did someone have? What would be the risk of the tumor getting bigger if you weren't on these various treatments? Because the langreotide and cabergoline can help control the size of the tumor and lower the growth hormone levels. Of course, the radiotherapy tends to control that too. Whereas the pegvisamont, which black blocks the action of growth hormone, does nothing to the pituitary tumor itself. So if there isn't an issue with the um, um, size and shape of the gland itself, of those various treatments, I suspect stopping the cabergoline first because it's probably least likely to be uh, effective. Um, but then there'll be discussion to be had with, with an endocrinologist as to whether you just keep on with the pegvisamont uh, and, and take either a lower dose or extend the dose between the langretide injections. Interestingly, uh, in, in England at least, uh, we're not meant to have patients on both those treatments because usually to get on to pegvisamont, one has to stop the somatostatin analog, the langretide. But, but anyway, we recognize the combination treatment can be effective. But I, I can't answer this question directly because it would depend on so many other uh, so many other factors. I think the principle of trying to reduce the medication to see what you need is the correct thing to do. Um, but but which of those should be depends on too many other factors that I just can't answer here. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, and then we've actually just got one more question in, so I'll end with this one. Um, in growth hormone replacement, what part of the therapeutic range would you aim to get IGF-1 levels to? So it's a really good question. Normally we aim to get patients into the middle or the upper half of the reference range. And of course the pushback to that advice would be, well, how do you know what my personal IGF-1 should be running at? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, but that's where most of the studies that have been done um, to try and find benefit from growth hormone have, have put the levels out. So if someone uh, is on growth hormone uh, and we get the levels up to that level and they don't feel much different, then at least we know we've given them a, a decent dose and a decent trial of growth hormone. If you get the IGF-1 to just into the normal reference range and people still don't feel well, well, you probably haven't given it enough try and you need to push it up. So I, I aim to get into the middle of the upper end of the normal reference range. And of course that reference range is both gender and age dependent. So it's important to make sure it's titrated to the right level, depending on the particular patient concerned. The other comment to make is I'm afraid the IGF-1 assays are not very good assays uh, and when they change the assay you can get in all sorts of difficulties because the range has changed uh, and actually how the measurement done uh, can change so uh, it's important that um, the IGF-1 is being monitored by the endocrinologist the endocrine nurse specialist and they recognize what's happening with the IGF-1 assay as long as the IGF-1 assay hasn't changed if the IGF-1 level is a bit too low you can put the growth hormone level up once it's up, if someone feels much better and their AGDA score is improving, et cetera, continue the growth hormone. If after six months you've gone on to growth hormone and you feel absolutely no different, then I wouldn't continue it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that is all of the ones we've had. So anything that comes in after, I will 
past you and we can deal with um, another time. But thank you so much, John, for your time today, um, especially on a Saturday. It's very appreciated. Um, and you've answered so many brilliant questions. We got through so many this week now from everybody. And I think everyone's so grateful for all the information we've covered um, and lots, lots of really valuable notes to take away.